Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, Season 4, Episode 23. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Charlebois. Our very special guest this week on the pod is Paul Hagerman from Canadian Food Grains Bank, where he oversees advocacy work on food security issues within the organization. Prior to his work with the Food Grain Bank, Paul worked in agriculture for 20 years uh, it's traveled through Canada, Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. What a great interview, and it, it's a real contrast with some of the other things that we'll be talking about in this episode. Uh, uh, Sylvain, I didn't know about Canadian Food Grades Bank. Apparently, it's more a Western thing. You've lived in the West. Did, were yep. you aware of it? And, and Yep. That's when I actually, while living in Saskatchewan, that's when I learned about the, the bank mm. itself. Uh, I thought it was a... An incredible organization. Of course, mm-hmm. when we think of uh, hunger and uh, food aid, we often talk about the World Food Program ran by the FAO uh, in Rome. Uh, so I, I don't think that the bank actually gets uh, its fair share of attention. So I, I was really glad that Paul was able yeah. to join us. Yeah, I learned a lot. It's a great interview and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough issue. So uh, we get yep. into it and he's, a, he's an eloquent spokesman for, um, and he's, he's, you know, he's in it and he's been in these places. So uh, this isn't just uh, someone sitting in the heart of Winnipeg watching the briar. This is and the inter- yeah, and the interview actually is happening at the right time for for the group. Uh, yep. it is supported by the federal government, and of course, there's a budget coming. So yep. <laughs> let's hope that someone in Ottawa is listening. Yeah, well, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Let's jump into the news. So I guess the breaking news, so to speak, is the Bank of Canada for the I think the fifth. Uh, session in a row did not raise interest rates. Uh, this has got to be good news, I would say, uh, generally for food prices. What's your take on uh, the impact of a, a steady no rate increase? Uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I think it's great news uh, for everyone, um, especially for uh, the younger generations that have been financially uh, challenged by higher interest rates, uh, they need the break. And, uh, and I think, I mean, it takes a while before an economy uh, gets to normalize rates. And so I, I was glad that the Bank of Canada decided to hold once again. Uh, I think mm-hmm. it, it will take a while. I mean, even the, the 10 consecutive hikes are still, um, are still affecting the economy. I mean, that's basically mm-hmm. what we learned today. Uh, but uh, what is interesting, though, is that the uh, economy is doing okay. I mean, rel- relatively speaking, the economy is still growing. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a good sign, despite uh, uh, the Bank of Canada's attempt to bring down inflation. That's always a danger, right? Uh, loss of jobs and things like that. But yeah. I think we're actually seeing this so-called soft landing happening, which is good news. Let's stick with economics for a little bit. Uh, there are some um, uh, some charts posted that you were sharing online that that showed Canada's relative performance and productivity. Um, and and there's been other people talking about this uh, in yeah. in the media is, is is really starting to drag against the U.S. Now the U.S. is one of the most productive, most powerhouse economies in the world. We yeah. probably do a little bit better against like the G7 or the OECD, but still. Um, it, it must be of some concern and, and, you know, it must, um, I don't know, it must provide some kind of pause for foreign international organizations looking to come into Canada. What, what, what do you think if I wrap this question up, if that's at all possible at this point and say, what do you think the, the impact on the food and restaurant yeah. and grocery industry is for this lack of productivity or this productivity shortfall? Well, so first of all, you're talking about the chart I posted on uh, X uh, earlier today, which was viewed by uh, more than 200,000 people now. It compares uh, the U.S.'s GDP per capita versus Canada's. And what I did notice is that the gap between the two has uh, has increased uh, for in the last few years. Uh, and that's a bit of a concern And for, for two reasons. One... I can't believe how uh, uh, President Biden is is trash uh, due to uh, its ec- economic um, platform. I mean, the American economy is doing quite well, <laughs> so right. I'm always a little bit surprised. But from from a Canadian perspective, of course, being in the food business, I, I've o- I'm always looking for indicators that can actually make Canada an attractive place to invest, and that is certainly not 
something that is making Canada uh, attractive to invest because the GDP per capita in Canada actually dropped in 2023, unfortunately. Hmm. And this is something that, uh, so the population is growing, the GDP itself, yep. the nominal GDP is growing, hmm. but GDP per capita is shrinking. And that's a bit of a concern, to be honest. And so as a grocer, let's say you're little or Aldi in the US, and mm -hmm. you're looking at that, you're basically looking at a trading down market for a while if if there's less wealth per person obviously it becomes harder it be, i mean it becomes a harder sell to actually encourage anybody to invest in canada especially when it comes to food so more stomachs but less wealth well a, a, cup, a couple of quick comments and i'm i'm certainly not an, an economist i play one on tv sometimes uh you're more <laughs> You're more of an economist than me. But one, I wonder if our sudden increase in population, right, by a percentage, we've had a massive increase in population, is playing with the figures a little bit. And second, I don't know, if I took the alternative view that if you're a hard discounter coming into a nation with a dropping GDP might signal opportunity as consumers shift, downshift into spending. I mean, you could, you could frame that in a couple of different ways. First of all, what do you think? Again, I, we don't want to get into the, the numbers around the economics, but I do think that there's something there with, a, you know, for the future, you know, we've taken a big, pretty big bet. We've brought in a lot of new Canadians, which may yep. have in the short term suppress productivity, but in the long run, accelerate it. Yeah, GDP uh, is not necessarily a, a perfect metric. Let's, mm. uh, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to look at other things. And that's the bet that uh, the federal government has, has, has made is to actually bring more people to eventually grow the economy over time so immigration won't help you today but it will certainly help you tomorrow so that's so it may be unjust to just look at gdp per capita mm. uh, but uh, let's hope for the best i mean uh, typically and just so you know i i did look at the at uh, at the data in europe and uh, and the data in europe is very similar to canada's uh the U.S. is a bit of an outlier, but mm. in Canada, we're just north of this superpower called the U.S., so we should be doing okay. It, it, mm. there, this this decoupling um, mm. between the U.S. and Canada is 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 a bit concerning. So maybe next year there'll be a complete reversal. Let's hope it happens. Uh, mm. But uh, if if it doesn't happen, then then that's a sign that we're we're in trouble. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I think I think we should have we could spend the rest of the podcast talking about this, but we're not a public policy or economics podcast. Let's talk back about food. But we're here to actually increase competition in the food business. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um you posted something, speaking of X and on social media, you posted something that was quite startling, uh, which was a research coming out of a pretty prestigious journal. I think it was The Lancet that the was Lancet. saying that um, obesity is now the global health problem bigger than global hunger, notwithstanding our guests talking about global hunger. Um, I was shocked at that. Tell, tell, tell us more. I was shocked as well. Yeah. Well, I was shocked. Uh, I was, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure we're paying enough attention to what's happening, uh, in, in not only the Western world, but around the world. I mean, people, more and more people are overweight and obese. Uh, so right now there's over a billion people uh, that are either overweight or obese. Uh, and that's more than, than the number of people who are suffering from hunger. And we are, according to the Lancet, we are mm -hmm. expecting the number to go up to 4 billion people by 2035. That is, that, that's a lot of people. And, uh, and frankly, when you look at, say, uh, Canada's uh, life expectancy, which has actually dropped for three years in a row now, mm. uh, that's not because of obesity. Of course, there's COVID, uh, COVID and yeah, other yeah. things, obviously. Yeah. But still, you, you do wonder where we're going with this. And, and my guess in, in the next couple of years, a lot of governments, including Canada's, will start looking at obesity as a serious problem. And how do you mm. fix that? So the food guide is five years old. The new food guide is five years old. Mm -hmm. And since the implementation of the new food guide, Canada has gotten fatter, not thinner. And so mm -hmm. that's one thing. Now, is, is the weight of someone or the BMI of someone a clear indicator of that person's health? No. There are other things that you need to look at. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
I, I think you look at any studies, uh, you can argue that o- being overweight or being obese will significantly affect your quality of life and will increase health risks for sure. Mm. Yeah. All right. All right. So two things. Uh, and the first one might trigger you into a bit of a rant, but let's see. <laughs> me? Is, no. Is it a fair fight? You and I, well, me, thinks there is a lot of obesity as a result of the food that is in the system today, the ultra high processed food that is adding calories. And, and quote unquote. You see, Quote, unquote. Now, okay, so tell me about your quote, unquotes, because uh, I kind of took it as gospel that there's a lot of food out there that isn't really that good for us. And if we just change the should type be of outlawed. food. Should we should Well, be. is it a fair fight? You know, because you, you do read these stories. And I've had some experience with it as well. When you go to Europe and you, you eat the same amount of food, but you, you seem healthier because the food is different. Or is this all just, you know, made up stuff and, and it's over overblown? What's, what's your opinion? I, I'm concerned that every time we talk about um, obesity, many people will point fingers at the food industry automatically, automatically okay. saying that's 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 uh, that's on it's the food fault. industry. It's their fault. To, yeah. yeah, exactly. And and I, I just don't buy it. I mean, the last time I ate cake, I didn't have a gun like on my head. I mean, it was you're not forced to eat. However, however, uh, we have to also be realistic about people's time, uh, the fact that people will certainly eat certain things based on impulse and things like that, uh, which is necessity. why I've always, I mean, you know, yeah. at the food bank, they may, may or may not getting, be getting the most nutritious food. And, exactly. And, and poverty is a big, big indicator and not everyone can actually eat well every single day because right. eating right. well, and it's in the literature, eating well costs more money. So we have to be fair here. Um, and, uh, and that's why I actually have always been, uh, very supportive of the front of package labeling rule, which will be implemented by 2026. You're basically telling Canadians, you know, within three years, when you walk into a grocery store, you'll see exactly which product has either too much sodium, too much sugar, or too much fat. I mean, look, me, look at, look at, look at what the industry did under severe pressure to get rid of trans fats. Trans fats. Uh, and there was no, right? there, there was no, and of course they, they banned trans fats later, but basically because you were, you were using labeling as an incentive for manufacturers to reformulate. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So I do believe that the front of package labeling will lead, will, will force industry to offer Canadians healthier products, which is a good thing. So there are lots of different things that are happening uh, in Ottawa. So the bill for uh, to to ban advertising for children that that is certainly an important bill that is mm-hmm. uh, that is in Senate right now. Uh, again, the food guide. I I do believe that after five years, I thought that perhaps the food guide would have changed things a little bit. I, we don't see the, any any evidence of that. It may take longer uh, mm-hmm. in order for the guide to be properly institutionalized. Uh, but uh, I do think that there's um, there's we need we need to encourage people to look at their lifestyle uh, mm-hmm. much more so. And I, that's my take. I mean, okay. the fact I have kids, you have kids. Screens are pretty powerful these days. I, that's you what know? I say. I'm not sure it's a fair fight, but uh, let's let's leave that particularly there for now. And and to the food guide, uh, your point about it's been around five years. I think um, to be fair to the food guide and the people who run it, three of those years were COVID, which you know, um, just a different time. So it's almost like it was you know fast forward a couple of years. They lost a couple of years momentum. I think clearly, uh, yeah. if they had public policy objectives. Now the second thing I was going to. I was going to say was, uh, and we've talked about it many times, and I'm going to bring up a, another related issue, is uh, all these very, very powerful, seemingly powerful drugs, uh, whether it's Wegovy or Ozempic, uh, that seem like it's a it very Ozempic? powerful... Ozempic? Ozempic. Ozempic? Uh, GLP-1 drugs that we are clearly, GLP-1 there's so drugs, much in yeah. demand, you can't find them here. Uh, I, I was just reading Weight Watchers... Uh, uh, you know, Weight Watch, we talked about this $100 million deal. They bought Sequence. They're offering now. They they said, listen, we're wrong and we should be 
you know, giving people these drugs. Could that be the answer? They lost Oprah. And they, they lost, lost Oprah. Oprah. Uh, I'll talk yeah. about that in a minute. It's kind of interesting. But could that be uh, a piece of the solution to the global I, health problem? I, I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, what I do know is that uh, in the PharmaCare bill that was actually introduced last week in Ottawa, uh, GLP-1 drugs aren't uh, covered. Yeah. But it will be interesting to see uh, how governments actually... I thought actually- diabetes drugs were covered. Not GLP-1 drugs. Oh, um, some diabetes drug, but not those in particular, mm. which I thought was very interesting. And uh, But I do believe that some governments will look at, look at this very differently. In the U.S., we actually expect that 25 million Americans will be taking these drugs by 2032. Wow. That's, wow, wow, that's wow. a lot of Americans. So and we don't have any data about in Canada. We don't I have no idea. All I know is that we ran out of them. We ran out of Ozempic for a while a yeah. few months ago. That's all we know. Well, would you would you say um that you know 10 to 1 rule more or less holds true? I mean, is Canada as level of fitness, I mean, you know, the, the average 36 36 year old Canadian is equal to the 76 year old Swede. You remember that uh, from participation? <laughs> yeah. You know yeah, that was exactly. complete. You know that was completely fabricated, right? That's the the story behind. I that. didn't it's, know. No, it's completely wow. fabricated. Just a PR wow. agency came up with that stat. Um, I mean, awesome. I, I guess my point is, it, it it feels like it would be about the same here. Yeah. Uh, let's let's wrap on this uh, this before we move on. You mentioned Oprah Winfrey. She walked away from uh, Weight Watchers WW, uh, which is uh, and the stock tanked twenty five percent. She ran away. She gave everything away. She gave all her ownership share uh, yeah, away to the um, National Museum of African American History, which is yep. now worth twenty five percent less. So, and she left a year <laughs> early. So, I don't know what's going on there. Maybe she's maybe she's having some disagreement around their direction, uh, which would be interesting. Uh, if anybody has any feedback, they could let us know. Uh, yep. Let's uh, let's move on to AI for a little bit. Now, you did a panel this this week uh, uh, on AI and agriculture. I wanted to tap into. Some of your yeah. key points from uh, from that we've often talked about technology as a big enabler of of agriculture. What uh, what say you? I mean, you can't you can't spell agriculture without AI. It's right in the it's right in the word. Agriculture, so, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, our, our our talk was very much about the entire supply chain. And and uh, so I'm a bit of a fan of AI. We've been using AI for a very long time at the lab, so it's not nothing new to us. So basically talked about, so on the panel, we had uh, a farmer from uh, from the Middle East. Uh, we had uh, a, a, a strategist from Europe and, and myself from, from Canada. It was a great panel, to be honest. It was a lot of fun. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, I'll be meeting with the uh, farmer uh, later this week to chat more about uh, AI and uh, and how things are evolving. And, but things are changing so quickly. Expectations are changing uh, I've always believed that farming are uh, farmers are ahead of this, uh, mm-hmm. ahead of the curve compared to mm-hmm. the rest of the industry. Uh, I know that the panel did agree with my comments about that, but there's so much to learn. And and of course, uh, the one the one question mark that came up a lot is, well, what will the government do? And uh, of course. It was a private sector sort of session, so everyone, I think, agreed that perhaps we should just see how the food industry will embrace Mm. uh, AI over the next three to five years and see how we can optimize everything. I mean, going back to our discussion last week about Wendy's and uh, dynamic pricing, I mean, Mm. you can Mm -hmm. tell that there is some easiness, uneasiness between the industry and consumers. What's in it for them? Yes. Uh, what's in it for me as a consumer, and and that that moral contract needs to be massaged a little bit more. So it's great that we can optimize things in the industry and adopt AI and and automate everything and use robotics. That's great, but at the end of the day, uh, I actually think that perhaps we need to listen to consumers and make a case for for consumers about AI. I don't know how you feel about that, but I think the Wendy uh, lesson, if I want to call it that way, uh, it was a bit of an eye-opener. I, I think people are, you know, surge pricing. What What is this? I mean, are you well, going to gouge I, I, me? or? Well, I think, I think it's a great discussion uh, because the immediate reaction is negative. In other words, I think it is not an AI issue. I think it's a trust issue. 
The trust is if you start talking well, about it's, dynamic it's pricing. It's AI. I mean, Immedi- right, immediately people you go using to- AI are not trusting the machine. I mean, I use AI and sometimes with models, I don't even believe what I'm mm. being told. <laughs> well, I, I, I just think that uh, we're at a place where um, there's a lot of skepticism about what brands are doing based on the rising cost of cost everything of and that yeah. they think there's some un- untowards activities going on or they suspect or they think about it and they didn't think about the positive parts of dynamic pricing. In other words, maybe I pay le- less for the chicken sandwich at four o'clock in the afternoon. They immediately went to the, I'm going to get ripped off. So I think trust is uh, something that needs to get rebuilt in the industry more than, more than people uh, think. Now, uh, do, you, do you think that the industry is, is, doing something about this or they're just no. hoping that time will heal. No, I think, I think their hope, I think their strategy is hope. Um, you know, when they're, when they're saying things like this out loud, I don't think, as you would often say, I don't think they're reading the room. Um, and, uh, Oh, you so don't think so. Eh? I, I, I don't agree. think, the, I don't I think agree. they're building trust. I think, I, I don't think well, they've what, understood. Why, what made the CEO mm-hmm. of Wendy's talk about this? They just took yeah. chat GP, Chat GPT de- yeah. is democratizing AI. Not a big deal. This is something we're going to do. Beautiful. Productivity, beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. All those things. We, we, we can, anyway, um, I could go on, but. But I, I agree I, with you. Absolutely. 100%. I think there's a trust deficit that needs to be addressed Ooh, uh, yeah. by the industry. Um, oh, yeah. Speak, but uh, let's leave, let's leave the news there for a few seconds or actually 20 minutes. Uh, and let's go uh, save the world. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's have a listen to Paul. It's a great interview. Paul Hagerman from Canadian Food Grains Bank. Uh, now, before we hear from Paul, we're going to hear a few words on behalf of our fantastic presenting sponsor, Cattle. Ever feel like the world of ratings and reviews needed a superhero? Well, enter Cattle, the caped crusader with Canada's largest, most diverse, and daily active consumer panels. That's right, Cattle is not your average podcast sponsor. So why choose Cattle? Because Cattle excels in consumer insights from your consumer, while also blazing trails in the realm of ratings and reviews, pioneering the future landscape of user-generated content. Beyond the valuable syndicated receipt data, they stand as unparalleled collector of reviews at scale, irrespective of category or price point. A testament to their impact, partnerships with giants like Walmart, Canadian Tire, and more. Visit AskCattle.com now for an exclusive The Food Professor podcast listener discount on your first review or research campaign today. That's AskCattle.com. This week, we have a special guest, uh, Paul Agerman, Director of Advocacy at the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Paul, welcome to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. Tell us about uh, your background and what you do uh, at at the bank itself. Okay, as you said, I'm the head of the, po- the the department that does advocacy work, public policy department. So I'm leading a team of people that are trying to influence the government, mostly the Canadian government, but sometimes governments in developing countries, on ways to reduce hunger. It's pretty big, but uh, you know we'll get into that a little bit more uh, as as we go along. So talk to us about Canadian Food Grants Bank. My guess is that many listeners don't know uh, of of the bank itself. Could you tell us more about its objectives, funding, uh, the raison d'être, everything? Okay. Um, we are quite well known in, in rural parts of Canada, um, w- uh, especially in the prairies in Ontario, but not well known in cities. So mm-hmm. what we do, our goal is to end global hunger. Uh, we're you're, part- you're based, sorry, you're based out of Winnipeg, correct? That's correct. That's okay. correct. We're based out of Winnipeg. Um, so we're a partnership of 15 church-based agencies across Canada that all do relief and development work in uh, in developing countries. Uh, we're a Christian agency, as I said, church-based. And so we're working in around 40 countries um, around the world through local partners. And last year, we were able to help around 1 million people to eat better. Sometimes that's providing them with food in a crisis situation. Sometimes it's helping them to, to grow more of their own food or process it or, or whatever. So a million, and, is that growing over the years? That's a uh, lot of people. 
It's a lot of people. It's true. Yeah. It's been fairly stable over several years. It goes up and down a little bit depending on where crises are and how much it costs to respond there. But uh, we get quite a lot of support from the Canadian government, from which for which we're grateful. And we also get a lot of donations from people across Canada. Again, grateful for that. And then we encourage people to learn more about the causes of hunger and get involved uh, and uh, and also speak to government so that you know the government knows that this is important to Canadians as well. So let's let's dive in and um, let's talk about what you would describe or we might describe as a current global food crisis, uh, particularly about the, you know, you've had a staggering rise in food prices. You mentioned uh, the cost of foods and and what kind of impacts of that and, and, and the various political situations that drive it. I can think you've operated in the Caribbean. I can think of Haiti, which is, you know, going through just tremendous change, change, change in a good word, tremendous revolution. What, what, what are those impacts on the vulnerable populations worldwide? You've, you've been at this 20 years. What, where do you see we are? And, and just tell us about what's happening today. Give us a, give us a snapshot of what it's like right now. Okay, well, I'll start off with just some, some statistics. Right now, there's, there's uh, about 783 million people in the world that don't get enough to eat. Uh, for some families, that means they've cut back from three meals a day to two meals a day. And in other cases, it means they've gone from a diverse diet with meat and vegetables to maybe a very simple diet that's almost entirely based on rice or based on maize or something. Mm -hmm. And then for other people, it means that they simply would not be alive unless they were getting food assistance. And food mm. assistance, I mean, international, or locally, we think of it as food banks, handouts, but, but uh, mm. globally, we talk about food assistance. So millions and millions of people. The number of people in the world uh, who are hungry was actually in decline for a couple of decades. So we were making mm. progress up until around 2015, and then things turned around partly due to conflicts in the world, partly due mm -hmm. to economic disruptions like the pandemic, partly due to uh, changes uh, caused by, by uh, climate disruptions, climate disasters. Mm. So the pandemic had a big impact on prices, supply chain problems afterwards, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. All of these things really disrupted production and disrupted uh, movement of, of uh, food around the world. And it's made prices very volatile. So in the places that we work, as I said, we work in around 40 countries around the world. So on average, over the last four years, we found that the price of maize, which is a stable food in much of Africa, is up by an average of 82%. Wow. wow. And wow. When you consider that for our food assistance projects, just the food cost alone makes up about 80% of total project cost, hmm. then clearly we're not able to help as many people. The dollar doesn't go as far as it yeah. used to with prices going up like that. And, and, and what would account hmm. for, the, for the balance? I guess it would be um, movement of, of your organization to go mobilize, the, the deliver the food, security around it. Is that what makes up the kind of the balance of, uh, as you said, most of it, the majority is... 80 plus percent is the cost of the food itself, yeah? Right, and staff costs. I mean, we have right. we, we have uh, program officers in Canada, and then there's the partners that we work with that have their own program officers. So staff costs and transportation is going to be a big part of um, of the rest. Right, and, and of those three things you highlighted, I'm kind of curious, climate, basically climate, COVID, the pandemic, and political unrest. What, what do you think is the biggest threat to to food security moving forward. I and mean, there's always going to be political turmoil. Uh, it kind of ebbs and flows. It happens to be ebbing right now. It's pretty particular now. But it, it, are you more worried in the long run about uh, climate change as a, as a driver? What, 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 keeps you, what keeps you up at night for the future? <laughs> I would say they're all pretty serious. I mean, mm -hmm. right now, conflict is the biggest driver of hunger. And we like to think we're making progress. And yet, uh, it's very mm -hmm. hard to predict. I mean, who would have thought three years ago, that we would see Russia invade Ukraine? Um, yeah. Who would have thought even six months ago that we would see the crisis now between uh, Israel and Gaza? These, these mm -hmm. things are not very predictable. Um, and when I talk about economic disruptions like the pandemic, I mean, 2019, who, who saw that coming? And yet the disruptions that it caused in terms of uh, farmers being able to access seed, access fertilizer, um, people being able to put 
put food on trucks and ship it to the city. Uh, people being able to go to the market and sell food or go to the market and buy food. All of that was completely disrupted by the pandemic, mm -hmm. which had huge impacts on food security. So, you know, that's the, the conflict and the, um, and the economic disruption side. The climate um, impacts, I would say, are increasing every year. Um, you know, we don't know where it's going to happen, but I think we can see that there are going to be more droughts. Rainfall is going to be more erratic. We're seeing stronger storms. We're seeing floods sure. in areas that don't get floods. And all of that disrupts food production, but also the ability to, to move food around, the ability to store food, people's uh, ability to, to uh, get access to food. So you mentioned two sources of um, funding. One is the Canadian federal government, and the other is uh, your your constituents, your population across Canada, the people, basically. So talk about uh, where you are in terms of funding. I mean, 82%, I'm, I'm pretty sure it hasn't gone up 82%. Uh, what, what's the situation that you face today? Our funding from the government has been pretty stable. Uh, we're fortunate that, that uh, we had multi-year funding from uh, the Government of Canada for food assistance, and we've also been able to get funding for our agriculture development programs. So I would say that's been uh, reliable. It's been growing slowly, and, and we're grateful for that. Uh, the Food Grains Bank's been around for 40 years, so obviously we've gone through governments of different political stripes, and, and sure. we've had... Um, uh, consistent support, uh, no matter who's in government in Ottawa. So we're grateful for that. Um, during the uh, and and also a lot of support from Canadians. There's something mm -hmm. called growing projects where groups of farmers will get together in a particular region and uh, or particular community. And somebody says, "Hey, I can I can donate seed." And somebody said, "Look, I've got this field you can use this year." And somebody said, "Okay, I'll cover the cost of fertilizer." And somebody else brings their planter. So basically, mm -hmm. everything you need to grow a crop is donated. And often that might be the seed company that donates the seed rather than a farmer. So lots of private companies involved. And at the end of the year, when they harvest the crop, they give the whole thing to the Food Grains Bank. And, and th that generates millions of dollars of revenue for us. There's uh, somewhere around 250 growing projects like that across the country. Oh, really? Oh, and. People just feel a strong sense of ownership. A lot of those community growing projects have been going for decades. Uh, you know, one person runs it for a while, they get tired or they get old, and somebody else says, okay, you know, I'll take over, I'll be the chair of the growing project, and, you know, they continue on. Wow. So that is just amazing how um, strong that support is. And if anything, it actually increased during the pandemic because people recognized that hunger was... Um, the, the pandemic caused more hunger and there was more need. And so sure, sure. people just put their shoulder to the wheel, so to speak, and, uh, and increase support. So, so food grains so bank itself that is not through. suffering. Oh yeah, go ahead. Right. I was going to say, let me unpack that for a second. So basically you would grow food here in Canada and uh, sell Correct. it on the market, not ship it to where it's needed because maybe it's too expensive to ship it there. And, that's question one, if you could kind of uh, unpack that for me. And then question two, I'm, I'm curious of all the work you do, how much is it um, uh, encouraging development and areas where they can to grow their own food, like supplementing and uh, helping that versus just actually delivering food? So I'm kind of curious about, I'm getting into the nuts and bolts here, so to speak, but I, I think our listeners are really curious. No, that's fine. So we used to ship food from Canada. Um, Canada used to have what was called a tied food aid policy, which meant that Canada would put you know, a certain number of millions of dollars into food aid, but all that money had to be spent in Canada. So we were buying Canadian grain or taking the Canadian grain that people donated from us, putting it on a ship and sending it to where it was needed. Obviously, there was some problems with that in terms of cost and just the time to get there. You know, you're responding to a crisis and we're saying, okay, it's on the boat. It'll be there in three months. <laughs> so it didn't work too right. well. Right, right, um, right. But that was Canada's policy. So part of our early work in terms of advocacy was encouraging Canada to untie its food aid policy so that we could send money instead of buying food and sending Canadian food. And we were successful at that. So now we send money and then we source, the, source whatever food we need locally. In many cases, we are delivering a bag of grain to somebody who needs it. More and more, we are 
uh, giving them a voucher that they can use at a local market, or we are giving them cash. Often it's a cash credit that comes up on their mobile phone, and then they can wow. use that cash to buy food. And part of our um, uh, uh, programming work through the local partners is identifying who really needs the food the most so that we know that the people who are receiving that cash are going to be spending it on food and not on other things. So that's why we, we work with mm. long-term partners who are um, in those local communities and know who are the most vulnerable people in the communities. But basically, if you had a dollar of aid, what percentage goes to encouraging or enabling people to grow their own food versus what goes into all those other things that um, that where they can buy food? What what's that percentage split? Well, a few years ago, I would have said it was about um, sixty cents towards uh, food aid, so meeting short term needs in crisis, and and about forty cents towards long term agriculture. Since then, it's it's moved to more fifty fifty, uh, not because we've reduced the amount of food aid, but because we have been able to get uh, new sources of uh, funding to fund the the long term agriculture work. So it's, yeah, it's around half and half now, um, responding to crisis and trying to build long-term resilience. Talk to us about uh, the importance of investing in aid uh, and international assistance. I mean, you do talk about uh, food security, but you also talk about peace, which is an important component, obviously, when it comes to food security. Perhaps share with our audience your experiences uh, in, in specific areas of the world, like Zimbabwe, Congo, or Rwanda. Okay, um, it's just about a year ago now um, that I traveled to those three countries in Africa on a research trip with uh, one other Canadian and visiting local partners. So we were looking at or trying to learn more about what we call nexus work. And nexus is really trying to combine humanitarian work, development and peace. So in some cases, you need to respond to crises. In some places, you're trying to reduce conflict or build peace. And in some places, you're trying to pave the way for long-term development. But can you do those all at the same time in the same place? Because often there's a need for that. So we were trying to find out what's what's working, um, what are some of the, the things that, that uh, could be done better. And a lot of organizations like mine in Canada are... Are, that's a growing edge for us. And it's also a growing edge for the Canadian government. So Canada's made some commitments internationally to say we're going to move towards nexus work and they're interested in that learning as well. Mm. So just for an example, one of the projects that we visited in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So this is the, um, the eastern side of Congo near Goma, uh, which you might be familiar with. It's in the Great Lakes region. Of, uh, of Central Africa, and it's an area that's been prone to violence for a long time. There's There's been armed groups operating there for a few decades. So we visited camps where people have been displaced. Uh, displaced people have moved to these camps. Some of them have been displaced by violence. Some of them have been, have been repla- displaced because of volcanic eruptions. But of course, when they flee their own areas, they go to other er- areas and there's people already living there. And there's a potential for conflict because the newcomers want some land to farm and the hosts already have land. So our project there is really working with the displaced people and the hosts, teaching both new agriculture skills, but also some some, um, conflict reduction skills to say, okay, we may speak different languages, we might come from different places, but what do we have in common and how can we get along? So... We're trying to uh, prevent the situation where these newcomers who have come in are now a source of conflict in the area where they are, where where they've arrived at. So in that way, we're trying to, you know, meet short-term needs, provide food for the long-term, reduce conflict. And that's a good example of the, the kind of nexus work that I'm talking about. So I guess that's how you maximize the impact of your aid, I guess. Is that correct? That's right. Um, we feel that development work and humanitarian work that's done well actually builds peace for the long term and that, uh, there's, you can, you can build, you can build peace or you can reduce conflict in ways that, that don't involve guns, for instance, (laughs) you know, we, we keep hearing about the need to increase the military to build peace. And, and we feel that if we can reduce poverty, if we can reduce hunger, that will reduce conflict and lead to longer term peace. So, 
we've seen Canada made a, make a little bit of progress in this area. I think there's definitely room for more um, exploring how to do this well and also putting more money and more deliberate effort into uh, this, this type, type of nexus programming. Let's uh, let's wrap with this question about uh, policymakers, and you know we have a lot of uh, uh, policymakers who listen to the podcast, and you know as you said, regardless of political affiliation, there's been a steady funding. The the demands on the public purse, so to speak, only seem to go up. Uh, what's your advice, or what's your, what would be your ask, and 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 how would you say they should prioritize funding for the Canadian Food Grains Bank and your mission? I mean. How do they think about, how should they be thinking about their priorities with Canada's place in the world? And, you know, listen, Canada's got, we've got our own problems, right? We've got people waiting in line at, at food banks here as well. How do, you, how do you put all that together and then have that conversation with decision makers at the government level and, and articulate what you'd like to see? Well, first, we recognize that uh, food prices are rising in times are tough in Canada. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the Food Grains Bank is made up of all these church-based agencies uh, in Canada, and most of them are involved in working on domestic poverty and hunger issues, so a lot of them are, uh, have their own food banks, etc. Um, when they come together through the Food Grains Bank, our mandate is really looking at global hunger. Right. Um, we know that there's safety nets in Canada. They're not perfect, but, but you know, there are some supports that people can access. And yet in many countries of the world, those safety nets don't exist. So that's where we're focusing. So in terms of what people can do, um, we, would, we would certainly encourage people to donate to the Food Grains Bank or to other organizations that are working to overcome hunger. And then um, w- in terms of a message to policymakers, um, I'm not actually asking policymakers to give more to the Food Grains Bank. If they, mm. if they want to, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm really talking about Canada's overall aid budget because Canada's overall aid has dropped significantly. It went down a lot in the 2023 budget. Uh, there's another budget coming up in 2024. Uh, it's going to be released in April. And yep. we think it's time to restore and even increase beyond what Canada's aid was last year. Hmm. There's some um, hungers rising in the world. Conflict is a risk. And I think Canada needs to be involved in that world to build the prosperity, to build the stability that helps all of us. So I would encourage anybody who listens to this to talk to your MP and say, we feel it's important that Canada remains engaged in the world and uh, increases its aid in order to play our our, uh, our rightful place and, and even uh, do our fair share because as, a, as an aid donor, Canada's way below average. Other, other aid donors are uh, doing much better than we are. Oh, interesting. As, as like a, a, G, a percentage of GDP or per capita kind of measure, yeah? That's right, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so the OECD countries, just, uh, which just, is... I'm the, just curious, where do we rank as a country compared to, say, uh, the G7? Um, hmm, I don't have on the top of my head where we rank G7. I tend to look at it against the OECD, the uh, uh, Organization okay. for right. Economic Cooperation and Development, which is about 25 countries, all of whom are aid donors. And we are just a little bit below average. Okay. Uh, in okay. there, when you look at it by uh, um, aid as a percentage of our economy. Well, listen, this has been a, a great interview. I mean, I learned a lot. Um, and I'm sure folks listening would like to continue to learn. Where do they go to get in touch with you or learn more? If they're going to go talk to their MP about this issue, where can they go to learn more? Well, uh, our website is foodrainsbank.ca. So you mm-hmm. can certainly learn more about uh, the program work we're doing, learn more about the causes of hunger. Uh, you could donate there. And then there's also a link there if you want to uh, send a message directly to your member of parliament, to the minister mm-hmm. of finance, to say this is important to me and I encourage Canada to do more. Well, Paul, on behalf of uh, Sylvain, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, an important issue and yep. you know, well-articulated. You've got such a great history. I, 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 you know, Echoing what Sylvain said at the beginning, uh, you know, living here in Toronto, I didn't know you really existed, but I think you're you're big part of the fabric, cultural fabric in in the West. So it's great to have you on the pod and share that, uh, share those insights and your wisdom and and a uh, big part of Canadian culture. So thanks for joining us on the podcast, and I wish you continued success and and uh, 
you know, safe travels. <laughs> you travel to some interesting places. Yeah. So I always say that, but for you, really, <laughs> safe travels. Okay. Thanks very much. And I hope that the budget in April will bring you some uh, nice surprises. <laughs> I hope so. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Well, that was a great interview. Uh, let's pick it up from there. Let's stay on the same kind of theme. So last week, Tony the Tiger was in the news for encouraging people struggling with food costs to consume their ultra high processed They're food for dinner. Great. <laughs> now the Cookie Monster is stepping into the fray. Cookie. The Cookie Monster is concerned about shrinkflation. He's got to eat cookie more cookies. Got smaller. <laughs> <laughs> you like my apparently, impression? Apparently, cookies, uh, that's a very good impression. Everybody Is can it? do a great, everybody can do a good I'm, cookie monster impression. Uh, cookie I'm costs French. are up 21%. Uh, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, it's not the first time Sesame Street has stepped into the fray. Uh, they did a post about uh, basically, Is everybody okay? Talking about mental health, uh, which got some news. Now the cookie monster, you know, is talking about shrinkflation. What do you, what do you make of this? What do you, does this build, does this, um, strike you be as as society's way to you know increase the volume on an issue that they're really really worried about well i don't know if it's going to work but i i actually uh think that uh cookie monster is more articulate to talk about translation than president <laughs> that's biden it's true uh that's during that's the super true. bowl you saw the ad i mean he was he looked like he was pissed off i mean no. No. At least Cookie Monster is making well, I think fun. He, I think, by the way, I think he's pissed off because it could cost him the election. By the way, that's a whole separate. Oh, is that I, you think so? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Can he, he, I mean, he looked like you, people are having a good time watching the game, watching Taylor Swift. No. In comes President Biden, upset with the food industry. I mean, it was kind of odd. Anyways. Well, I think I think I, I I don't think any of that stuff is a happenstance. I think they're very worried that while the as we talked at the beginning of the podcast, the American economy is doing very well. It doesn't very feel well. like that. It doesn't feel yeah. like that to the average American, and I think um, I think they're very worried about that. Uh, but anyway, how, so how much it, do you think the Cookie Monster is charging for uh, for being a spokesperson? <laughs> I don't think <laughs> anything. I I think Sesame Street is a social good. I mean, I think they they've done they've been a change agent for decades, right? I mean, in terms of. Uh, they've been very forward leaning. So anyway, it's fun so to see. So you think that Sesame Street has the ability to actually make cookies bigger again? No, I think I think they have the ability to to somehow, in a simple post, articulate the anxiety of consumers that this is you know once it reaches the Sesame Street level, it's yeah. a, right. Like I, I, I it's a funny yeah, it's dynamic. Really, I, I think it's a lot of fun. And in fact, I just did a CBC show for kids. <laughs> about shrink shrinkflation. I mean, it's and yeah. frankly, I mean, you kind of dial it down a little bit, but uh, still, I mean, ki kids can understand when they get less uh, cookie. Right. Right. That's that's not fun. I mean, that's yeah. not fun. That's not fun for anybody. All right, last thing, and uh, this could be even more shocking to Canadians. We're maybe on the cusp of losing bagged milk. I mean, that's like a cultural thing. Oh, like my a, God. Our bag milk, right? <laughs> like, I remember a day, uh, which may date me or age me, that, you know, these jugs, and I'm like, who washes these jugs? I love, I, you know, I'm a bit of a germaphobe, so I love bag milk because it's very clean. But it is true, in our household, we struggle sometimes to get to the bottom of that third bag because we're just, you know, we're drinking alternative type, a plant-based, or exactly, we're just drinking yeah. different ones, or everybody wants... So I want skim. Who changes the bag? Two percent, right? you know. How many just, times you went to the fridge and you saw an empty bag oh in the God. container? Well, and I've never, by the way, in case my wife is listening, left an empty bag in the fridge. So there you go. Really? Uh, but you're but, a saint. But what's what's going on here? Is is it just the changing dynamics that may and economics that may uh, force or? change the industry so I, I, I can see the eyes of people living west of thunder bay going what are they talking about because <laughs> there are no bagged milk west of thunder bay did you know mm -hmm. that no, i did not know that they don't exist yeah it's only in ontario quebec and right here in the atlantic ah. so yeah we're lucky people we can well, actually buy bags of milk. So, if you were a betting, if you were a betting man, would you say that bagged milk is, um, you know, in five years we won't see bagged milk in this country, or what do you think? Uh, I would say ten years. 
I would okay. say 10 years. Yeah. And it's due to us, the, the demand, like consumers. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. look at the, yeah. it's four liters. It's a lot of milk. Uh, fewer, fewer people are drinking milk in adulthood. Uh, there are more dairy alternatives. Those dairy alternatives are actually at parity. They're, some of them are actually cheaper than fluid milk. And, uh, and fluid milk consumption per capita in Canada is down. It's been mm. down for many, many, many years. So you do wonder what's going to happen to four liter containers or four liter uh, mm. formats uh, at, the dairy, at the dairy section. So I do believe that there's going to be some of that uh, going on. Uh, okay. and, but I mean, the one thing that I'm concerned about for bagged people or fans of bagged milk is mm. one, from a food safety perspective, I don't know about you, but I've never heard, I think one or twice, no, I've never heard people uh, complaining about the quality of the milk in those bags. Uh, mm -hmm. I have seen, and I've experienced it myself, soured milk coming out of a container, um, uh, but not with bags. I, I, there's, there, there seems to be, they seem to be performing well logistically with the cold chain. That's what I'm saying. So that's yeah. good. The other thing, of course, is, for for our our kiddos and people with arthritis, I mean, when you when you're buying four liters, it's mm. a heavy container. But with a small, when you buy three small bags, it's lighter for kids. It's mm. lighter for people who can't really lift, uh, you know, uh, heavy stuff in the kitchen. So, to me, that those are the things that perhaps could actually make uh, bag milk. Uh, stay longer okay. than uh, than maybe you know five years or so. Well, well, if you want bagged milk and you're a listener, put your hand up and say, uh, call your local MP, I guess, and say I I want bagged milk. And but and, demand or, for bagged milk has gone drinking. down by about one percent in the last year. It's not much. I mean, yeah. we're not looking at a huge drop here. All right, but we are expecting that that demand to to continue to drop. Uh, I wanted to uh, dedicate this episode to the folks at uh, the Covered Bridge Potato Chip Company who yes. uh, had a big oh. fire, Heartland, New Brunswick. Uh, they I had know. a fire that uh, destroyed. Also, uh, you their... heard about it, eh? Yeah, I heard about it. I didn't want to uh, bring it up because it was right here, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, big. It's a big deal, right? New Brunswick, a big employer. The factory was built in 2009. I love those I chips. I, I went as in Halifax. I grabbed some. Uh, brought some home because they're oh, great. So you tried they're, some, eh? They're, they're good. Great. Yeah, I like oh, the, yeah. the pepper and, and um, the pepper and salt. Anyway, major employer in the region. You connect with them and invite them on mm -hmm. our show. That's a great idea. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah that's a great idea. Let's uh, We should do that and, you know, good luck to them. And hopefully they have lots of insurance and can rebuild and uh, get back to making fantastic. It's New uh, Brunswick. They can do anything. Chips. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, let's leave it there. This great episode. Uh, we talked about a lot of stuff, as always, uh, and we'll be back next week. Now, a reminder to everyone or an ask for everyone, uh, if you like what you're listening, uh, jump on to uh, Apple, for example, and give us a, a five-star ranking because it really helps uh, spread the word. So if you have the opportunity, go on and give us a, a five-star ranking. That would be very helpful. But until then, I'm Michael Blanc, podcaster, a consumer growth consultant, a keynote speaker, and you are... I'm the food professor, Sylvain Charlebois. All right, Sylvain, safe travels, and we'll talk next week. All right, take care.